All right, this is Honors Algebra 2 Pre-Calculus. We're doing 5.2 in Algebra 2. Uh, this is the second video in this section, and we're going to talk about Pythagorean Theorem. So uh, a lot of you probably already know Pythagorean Theorem, from whether it's from your uh, previous algebra classes or geometry, right? So, uh, But essentially, Pythagorean Theorem is named after Pythagoras, who was a Greek mathematician. If you want to watch an entertaining video about Pythagoras, uh, check out Vi Hart. That's V-I, and then her last name is H-A-R-T. Uh, on Khan Academy's website. She's got a really great series of videos about everything from Fibonacci sequence to Pythagoras to all sorts of cool things. Uh, really fun, nerdy stuff, uh, really enjoyable. And I would normally show you those videos in class if we have some downtime at the end of a class period or something, but uh, life is weird and we don't have class right now because of uh, a pandemic. So anyway, uh, so let's talk about Pythagorean theorem. So essentially Pythagorean theorem is a way to find uh, the legs and the hypotenuse of a right triangle, if you know any two pieces of that information, you can find the other one. So if you know two legs, you can find the hypotenuse. If you know a leg and a hypotenuse, you can find the missing leg. So um, if we look down here, right, so uh, the legs of a right triangle are the sides that essentially touch the 90 degree angle, right? So if we if we look here, here's our 90 degree angle, right? The legs are the two sides that touch that 90 degree angle. Sorry, I'm terrible at drawing, right? Uh, and the hypotenuse is the side opposite that 90 degree angle. The hypotenuse is always the longest side, right? The hypotenuse is always longer, and it's generally C in the Pythagorean theorem, right? So we usually use C for the hypotenuse. So C is the hypotenuse, and A and B are the two legs. It doesn't really matter which one you call A or B. So, um... If you actually go into what he was really physically describing, and Pythagoras is kind of an interesting dude, again, check out the, the Vi Hart video, um, but Pythagoras didn't believe in irrational numbers. He didn't believe in something like the square root of two, which we obviously know is a thing that exists. Uh, Pythagoras believed in uh, ratios of uh, essentially counting numbers, right? So in the ratio of three to four, but he didn't believe in, uh, you know, irrational numbers. So, um, one of the things that we're gonna see as we move forward with Pythagorean uh, theorem is that as you move into AP Calc and, and certainly sometimes in physics and, and all that stuff, you're gonna wanna memorize a handful of what we call Pythagorean triples. And you can see that this image here uh, is believed to contain Pythagorean triples on this, uh, on this tablet, right? On this ancient tablet. What a Pythagorean triple is are common Pythagorean theorem patterns uh, that occur regularly enough that it would just be easier to memorize it uh, than it is to have to find it every time. So the easiest of these is three, four, five. So Pythagorean theorem, and we'll see this on the next slide, says that a squared, leg squared, uh, plus b squared, the other leg squared, equals c squared, the hypotenuse squared. So three squared plus four squared equals five squared. And you can see that three squared plus four squared does in fact equal five squared because this would be nine plus 16 this would be 25. Both sides are in fact 25, right? It's true for all of these, 3, 4, 5, 5, 12, 13, 7, 24, 25, 5, uh, 8, 15, 17, 9, 40, 41. And again, just to point out that there is some logic behind these, uh, I would, just for fun, I'm going to walk you through how you can actually prove the pattern uh, that you'll see here. So years ago, one of my students uh, said, hey, I see a pattern that works for, uh, for 3, 4, 5, and 5, 12, 13 and 7, 24, 25, and 9, 40, 41, uh, but not for the 8, 15, 17. And, and here's the pattern he saw. He noticed that if he squares this number, he would get a 9, and that essentially these are the numbers uh, essentially right below half of 9, right? If you split 9 in half to two integer numbers, the two halves would be 4 and 5, right? And then, and then the kid said the same thing where he said, oh, well, 25... Uh, 5 squared is 25, and if I split 25 in half, it would be 12 and 13, right, if you're splitting in integer halves, essentially, so not exactly in half. And sure enough, uh, 7 squared is a 49, and if you were to split that into the two integer numbers at the middle that sum to 49, it's the 24 and the 25. And, and sure enough, 9 squared is 81, and that's what these sum to. And so he made a hypothesis that you could test and see if, for instance, uh, 11, right, so an 11 squared right? 11 squared should be 121. If you split 121 into the two numbers at the middle that it's closest to, right, it would be 60 and 61, right? Like closest in, in half. So you could actually check and see is 11 squared uh, plus 60 squared, right? If we take the square root of that number, 3, 7, 2, 1, we should get a 61. And hey, it works, right? So, um, so after doing this experiment and saying, oh, hey, that's cool. That works for those odd numbers. 
uh, we were actually able to kind of walk through how to prove it. So uh, what I'm going to do in the next slide, I'm actually going to insert a slide just for fun, and I'm going to show you how that works and how we can walk through and see that that's true. Uh, and that'll work for any odd number that you pick to start with, right? Just like we saw this 357. And then we can walk through how it works if you start with 8, because you have to, for the even numbers, you end up having to make essentially a different hypothesis. So let's insert a blank page and just walk through this, right? So here's our supp supposition. Let's call this, uh, we'll call this number n, right? And our argument is that essentially these two numbers, right, should be the two numbers at the middle that add to n, uh, and n squared, right? So essentially, if you were to take, um, so if you go back for a second, right, if you took this guy right here is like n squared plus 1, which would be 10 over 2, and this guy right here is like n squared minus 1 over 2, right? And you can see that that also works uh, so that works here because n squared plus 1, 25, plus 1 would be 26, divided by 2 is 13. Uh, n squared minus 1 would be 24, divided by 2 is 12. So what we're essentially saying is we are making the supposition that this is n squared minus 1 over 2, and this is n squared plus 1 over 2. So the question is, are these three numbers always a Pythagorean triple, right? Um, That's not how you spell triple. Uh, and let me actually clarify. So, um, so I shouldn't use n. I take it back. Um, but since we're saying n is odd, there's a way in math to write n is odd. Instead, you use 2n plus 1. So if that were the case, we'd be arguing is 2n plus 1, right? That's my original odd number. Is that a Pythagorean triple with... 2n plus 1 quantity squared minus 1 over 2, and 2n plus 1 quantity squared plus 1 over 2. The question is, do these three numbers together make a Pythagorean triple, where this is a, b, and c? And we can actually prove that it does make a Pythagorean triple, uh, where this is my a, b, and c, right? Leg, leg, and hypotenuse. Uh, so I'm going to walk through it. Again, if you have no interest at all in walking through that, we can. And again, it's not wrong to, to start with this idea that, oh, hey, it's an n, but since we have that n must be odd, because as you see up here, that pattern does not actually work uh, for, for the 8, right? If you tried the pattern with the 8, 8 squared is 64, and these two numbers do not sum to 64, right? So there's, there's a caveat there that we have to walk through a uh, special uh, different version of this rule. So for, for n is odd, we can actually see if this is always a Pythagorean triple. So the question is, does my a squared plus my b squared, which is going to look like this, uh, squared minus 1 all over 2 quantity squared, does that equal my c squared, which is going to be a 2n plus 1 quantity squared plus 1 all over 2. If I can simplify the left-hand side, and make the right-hand side look exactly the same, then the answer is yes, this is always a Pythagorean triple. And again, if you totally want to skip this, if you're like, geez, Hogan, this is not a thing I signed on for in this class, that's cool too, it's fine. If I foil this thing out, which I'm gonna have to do three times, so I might as well just get the hang of it once. If I foil this out, it's gonna be a 4n squared plus a 4n plus a one, right? I already know that. So that means that it's also a 4n squared plus 4n plus one right here, minus 1 all over 2. And on this side, it is also a 4n squared. Oh, I missed a squared up here. Sorry, guys. Right there, there's a squared. Um, 4n squared plus 4n plus 1 plus 1 all over 2. And this was inside a squared. And this was inside a squared. OK, so oh, and yeah, so there we go. All right, so um, I have. When I clean this up, right, so this is a 4n squared plus 4n plus 1. This plus 1 minus 1 goes away, and I think I can cancel a 2 out of this stuff, right? I think I can factor a 2 out, and I get that this is a 2n squared plus 2n quantity squared, right? Uh, and the question is, does that equal... When I do this, I think I can put these guys together, and I end up getting 2n squared plus 2n plus 1 quantity squared. So still totally disgusting, no argument. But the question is, can I show that when I clean this side up, it looks entirely like this side? So let's go ahead and foil out this 2n squared plus 2n times 2n squared plus 2n. 
when I FOIL this, I'm going to end up with a 4n to the fourth, right? That's first. Outer and inner will both be a 4n cubed. So that's an 8n cubed. Uh, last is going to be a 4n squared. I still have this 4n squared plus 4n plus 1. And then I'm asking if this is equal to on this side. Now, when I distribute, it's going to be a lot harder because I'm going to have to, it's not a FOIL situation when you have three terms, right? So I'm going to take this guy and distribute him to everybody over here, which is going to give me a 4n to the fourth, a 4n cubed, and a 2n squared. That guy's not done. Now I'm going to distribute the 2n. I'm going to get a 4n cubed, a 4n squared, and a 2n. Now he's done. And then I'm going to get a 2n squared, right? I'm distributing this one, plus a 2n plus a 1. There we go. Okay, so now I'm now at this point where the question is, does the left-hand side equal the right-hand side after this insane amount of work? Okay, well, let's clean up both. Over here, this is my only n to the fourth, so I have a 4n to the fourth. Great, he's done. I seem to have only this guy as an n cubed, so I have an 8n cubed. Great, he's done. Um, I have this guy and this guy as an n squared, so I have an 8n squared. Um, I have only this guy as a, a regular old n, and I have this solo plus 1. Cool. On the other side, it seems to me that I have only this guy as an n to the 4th, because I conveniently lined them up in columns, so I have a 4n to the 4th. For my cubes, I seem to have an 8n cubed. For my squareds, I seem to have 2 plus 4 plus 2, which is an 8n squared. For my linear term, I seem to have a 2n plus a 2n, which is a 4n. And then for this solo guy sitting all the way on the end by himself, I seem to have a plus 1. And sure enough, they're the same. So it turns out that that pattern will work for any odd number that you pick. Uh, if you pick an odd number, so you could transfer this to like, you pick even a really obnoxiously large odd number if you wanted, right? If you wanted to pick a really obnoxiously, so just, just for argument's sake, right? Let's say that we pick, oh, I don't know, 57. I'm probably gonna regret this, right? So I then say, okay, well, what's 57 squared? I'm not gonna do that in my head because I'm just not gonna, right? So 57 squared, cool. Okay, so 57 squared is a 3249, so, this next term should be 3248, one shy of that divided by two, and this other term should be 3250, one more than the 49 divided by two. So my argument would be, and again, you can totally blow past this if you want, it's just a kind of fun side note, 3248 divided by two, 3250 divided by two. So I get that 57, 1624 and 1625 is a Pythagorean triple, leg, leg, hypotenuse. Now, would you ever need to know this? No, you would not, right? Um, but it's kind of cool just showing that if you, so if you ever are the person that comes to me, because years ago a student came to me, years ago I presented this to a student and my student said, hey, I see a pattern, what do you think? And so then we did some logic to figure out if the pattern always works. It's never a bad thing if you bring a pattern to me and say, hey, does this algorithm work to figure out this pattern? And sometimes the answer will be yes, that's totally awesome. Other times the answer will be yes, but there's a caveat it only works for these odd numbers, right? Uh, and there's a separate pattern for the even numbers. The short version, and I'm not going to go through proving it, is that if you were to square this, you'd get a 64, right? If you cut it in half, you get a 32, these are the same two even, or the two odd numbers that sum to 32, right? So essentially, if, if you were to call this thing 2n, because that's how we write even numbers, right? If you call this 2n, this is 2n quantity squared, right? Which would be 4n squared over 2. So this is 2n squared. Um, essentially, if you divide it by 4, because you divide by 2 and divide by 2 again, uh, so 2n squared... Uh, 2n squared over 2 would be my 32. So it would be 2n squared over 2. So you do n squared minus 1. Right. Does that work? That works. Yep. And this would be n squared plus 1. So that's the pattern for your Pythagorean triples if it's an even number. It's 2n, n squared minus 1, 
n squared plus one, and that is also a Pythagorean triple. Again, you don't ever have to know any of this, and you totally could have skipped this section of the video if you're not into it. But it's cool that if you want to challenge yourself and say, hey, I see a pattern, does that pattern work? I will do my very best to try and walk through with you why it does work or why it doesn't work uh, and try to figure out and troubleshoot sort of your, your logic behind that because that's a really cool thing to do and it shows a lot of interest in higher level mathematics if you kind of push yourself to see patterns in what other people see as chaos. Anyway, moving on, let's do Pythagorean theorem. So moving on, Pythagorean theorem. In a right triangle, A, B, C, uh, with the right angle at C, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Um, when you apply the Pythagorean theorem, use the principal square root because distance and length cannot be negative. I want to add a caveat to that. Uh, so although that is true about the hypotenuse, the hypotenuse will never be negative. Eventually, in pre-calculus, we're going to learn that sometimes triangles are, are put on coordinate planes where one direction has a positive side, like this would be a positive 3 because in the x direction it's positive, but this would be a negative 4 because it's down 4, and the hypotenuse would be a positive 5. So as a caveat, in general, at this level of math, you're not going to have negative side lengths on a triangle. But as you start to apply those triangles to real physical situations, uh, sometimes those side lengths have direction, and that direction will have a negative sign. But again, the hypotenuse is never negative. So let's just go ahead and do some nice, happy Pythagorean theorem problems. Uh, we're going to find the unknown length in each triangle, and we're going to give answers to the nearest thousand, thousandths because your book is crazy and always says tenth when they shouldn't. Okay, so these are my legs, right? Z is my hypotenuse. So x squared plus y squared equals my z squared, and then I'm going to use my calculator. Uh, essentially, I'm going to be pretty lazy and just go ahead and type into my calculator this thing. I don't even see a real reason to bother to clean it up first, right? And I'm going to get an approximate answer for my z. So uh, when I type this in my calculator, I'm going to type in the square root of, in parentheses, 2.5 squared plus 5.1 squared. Close the parentheses, and there's my answer. Now, remember, you can round or truncate uh, no matter what another teacher uh, or test tells you, round or truncate to the thousandth place uh, in my math class, right? Uh, because we're prepping for AP Calc. So you could cut it, oh, my bad. You could cut it here, right? So I would either take 5.679 or I would take 5.680. Either of them are fine, don't give me both, right? You can either round or truncate. Now here, this is the hypotenuse, right? So. 8.2 squared equals 4.0 squared plus p squared. So I'm going to get 8.2 squared minus 4.0 squared equals my p squared. So what I'm going to type in my calculator is 2.5, not 2.5, come on brain. 8.2, sorry, glanced over for a sec. 8.2 squared uh, minus 4 or 4 squared, like you can write 4.0 or 4 because they're the same, is going to give me my p uh, so I'm going to go ahead and put my calculator. Uh, I'm going to do second enter because I'm lazy, right? And I'm just going to go back and type over 8.2. Make sure that this is a minus and then 4.0 and hit enter. Right, and so again, you can round or truncate your answer. So my answer in this case, rounding or truncating, is going to be the same. My p is approximately 7.158. All right. So let's go ahead and try a p4. Uh, same idea, right? So here, this is the hypotenuse, right? So it's a leg that you're missing. So essentially, uh, if you realize that what you're going to end up doing is subtracting to solve, right? you're going to get that e squared is the square root of f squared, which would be the 8.5 squared minus the 2.5 squared. Sorry, ignore the squared. Cool. So I'm going to get e is approximately, and then we go ahead and put, uh, I'm going to do second enter, because again, why not be a little bit lazy? I'm going to go over and change the 8.2 to an 8.5, and the 4.0 to a 2.5, and hit enter. Notice that the hypotenuse should always be the longest side. If it's not, you definitely did something crazy. So my E is approximately 8.124. It doesn't matter if I round or truncate, I get the same answer. Uh, if we go ahead and do the last one, right? Um, so for the setup for the last one, I see that this is the hypotenuse. So T squared is going to be the 3.4 squared plus the 8.7 squared. So my T is the square root of 
3.4 squared plus 8.7 squared. And again, I'm just going to type that in my calculator. So second enter, right? I'm going to go ahead and change this to a, oh, I didn't mean to delete, 3.4 squared plus 8.7 squared. Close my parentheses, double check that those are the right two numbers and hit enter. And then that's my answer, right? And again, your hypotenuse should be the longest side. If it's not, you did something wrong. So my T, which is the hypotenuse, is approximately 9.340 or 1, right? Because again, you can either round or truncate. So it's a 0 if you truncate. If you round the 7, I'll turn that into a 1. So there's my answer. All right, cool. We're going to do uh, two quick word problems, and that'll be it for this section. So uh, the diagram shows support wires AD in red and BD in green. How far apart are the support wires uh, where they contact the ground, give your answer to the nearest whole foot. And in this case, you're actually going to go ahead and give it to the nearest whole foot. So the issue here is that there are actually two triangles, right? There's this right triangle, the green one, right? So the green right triangle, let's call this distance B, right? Um, has a height of seven, uh, 760, sorry, 760, right, feet. And the wire itself is 850 feet. So I can use Pythagorean theorem to find B, but there's also a right triangle, A, that has that 760 feet and a 900 foot wire, and then this side A. Seems to me, like, so here's, here's my A triangle, right? Seems to me that the question they're asking is what is this section right here? So my answer is gonna be whatever A minus B is, right? A is the longer length, B is the shorter length. So I'm going to use Pythagorean theorem to find both A and B and then just subtract them. So it seems to me that B is going to be the square root of the hypotenuse squared minus the other leg squared, and that A is going to be the exact same thing but with the other hypotenuse, right? The hypotenuse that's the 900 feet. So I can just type that all into my calculator at once if I want, right? I can say that my answer is this whole quantity and then just typey, typey, type and get an answer. Or you can find each individual answer separately. It doesn't really matter. So this quantity minus the smaller quantity, 850 squared minus 760 squared. So I'm going to get that the answer, second root, right? Uh, 900 squared minus 760 squared. Close the parentheses and then subtract second root 850 squared minus 760 squared, close that and hit enter. And then here's my answer. Now they said round to the nearest foot, right? They don't want us to go to thousands. And that makes sense because a lot of times in word problems, they actually don't want you to give that much information. Uh, so my final answer, my answer ends up being if I round to the nearest foot, this four means it's gonna round and stay at 101, right? So 101 feet, okay? So I'll give you a P5 to try, and, uh, and then we'll call it day on this video. So P5, construction, two support wires, uh, and their lengths are shown in the diagram below. What is the distance in meters between the wires uh, represented by CD? So this is the distance that they want, right? So uh, again, you're in a situation where you have two triangles. You have the really long triangle. Like So I'm just going to call this entire length D, and I call this little length lowercase c. Okay, and you don't have to, you could call them X or Y or whatever, but I'm gonna use little d, uh, and this is a 68, and this is a 208, right? That's that big triangle, like my right triangle. And then this little triangle, right? This little triangle is a 68 and a 112 and C. So I'm gonna argue that if I find, if the answer that I want is gonna be the D, the full blue length here, minus that little red C, right? So D is going to be the square root of hypotenuse squared minus that leg squared, right? C is going to be the same thing, but with the different hypotenuse. And then I'll be able to get my answer. So really what I'm going to do is I'm going to do second enter because I already did all of this work and I'm just going to go ahead and change the 900 to a 208. And I'm going to change the 760 to a 68, which means I'm going to have to delete one of those zeros, right? I'm going to change the 850 to a 112. And I'm going to change the 760 to a 68, which means I'm going to delete a zero. And then I'm going to hit enter, right? 
and that tells me that my wires are 107.576 feet apart, or meters, meters apart, but they say to the nearest tenth of a meter. I hate when they do this. They said tenth. That's annoying. Uh, so they want, so a whole meter at least makes sense, because that's going for a thing. They said tenth, so the answer they want is this in meters. Okay, that's the answer they want. But the AP Calc test is never going to say tenth. The AP Calc test is either going to tell you nearest whole meter or they're going to ask you for thousands every single time. So, so that's what the AP Calc test would want. Cool. So that's it for 5.2.